This house is for us, the couple, to live in. You need to leave. At that moment, the calculated plan of my scheming mother-in-law, Susan, was accomplished. I had always been suspicious of my mother-in-law, who was acting differently than usual. However, a mistake I carelessly made led to the outcome of my mother-in-law's plan exactly as she had imagined. I was filled with regrets about what I should have done differently at that time. But by then, it was already too late. Even if I impulsively presented the divorce papers, from my mother-in-law's perspective, that too was part of her plan. Yet, I never imagined that my lack of planning would significantly disrupt my mother-in-law's scheme. As is often the case in old tales, those who envy the successful and act maliciously don't end up with the outcome they desired. Ultimately, it seems that luck only comes to those who are honest and kind to others. My name is Erica. I hit it off right away with Aaron, whom I met through a friend, and it didn't take long for us to start dating, despite the nine-year age difference with a younger Aaron. I was overwhelmed by his fervent advances and ended up marrying him. However, after we got married, Aaron seemed to lose interest in me and suddenly became cold. Aaron, who was indifferent towards me, remained the same even after our child was born, showing no interest in parenting. Aaron's job involved many transfers, most of which required him to live alone far away. Even after 10 years of marriage, it was rare for him to be at home. Our son, Sean, is very shy and doesn't seem to think of Aaron as his father. Even when spending time with Aaron, Sean never warms up to him and always hides behind me. Realizing I couldn't rely on Aaron after we got married, I started working as a freelancer from home. My work is going well with a stable income, so I'm not struggling with life with Sean at all. In fact, I earn more than Aaron who, despite frequent transfers, has hardly climbed the career ladder. However, living like a single mother, I face a challenge living with Aaron's parents. Unlike Aaron and me, whose relationship has cold, his parents always seem to get along well. At first, I was honestly envious of their relationship. But after living together, I realized Aaron's parents were not just an ordinary loving couple. Susan, my mother-in-law, treats my father-in-law, John, almost like a pet, knowing John would never go against her. Susan always says whatever she wants to him. And Susan, who justifies her behavior as a way to avoid stress, takes the same arrogant attitude towards everyone. Such selfish actions by Susan are, of course, directed at me too. Susan's tyrannical behavior doesn't stop at treating me like a maid. Even after 10 years of marriage, Susan dislikes that I am 9 years older than Aaron and insults me every time she sees me. It's a shame Aaron married such an older woman. He would have been better off with a younger and cuter wife. It was Aaron who proposed to me. Yet, to suggest that I tricked him into marrying me is infuriating. Still, living together, I didn't want to stir up trouble and worsen our relationship, so all I could do was endure. One day, I received an unusual call from my father, wondering what had happened. I answered the phone to hear that my mother, Michelle, had been in a traffic accident. The sudden news nearly stopped my heart. But when I hurried to the hospital where Michelle was, I saw my panicking father and Michelle greeting me with a smile. Your father tends to overreact. I'm fine, so don't worry. Indeed, Michelle looked well and responded energetically, making me think her injuries were not severe. However, the doctor explained that Michelle's leg was fractured, and even with surgery, full recovery was unlikely, and she might never walk again. Eventually, Michelle underwent surgery and was later transferred to a rehabilitation hospital for home recovery. After six months of rehabilitation, Michelle was able to walk again, but not as before. She became dependent on a walker even after returning home. I lived with Michelle for a few days after her discharge from the hospital and realized it was impossible for my elderly father with a bad back to care for my mother, who was left with sequelae from her fracture. I started visiting my parents' house frequently, leading to a busy life juggling work, caring for my child, dealing with my in-laws, and helping my parents. Susan, who was not pleased that I was prioritizing my parents' care, never offered me words of comfort despite my busy schedule. And don't you feel embarrassed that a wife doesn't do household chores? John and I come home tired from work. And what are you doing? Though Susan's attitude, 
complaining to me every day, was infuriating. I could only respond with a forced smile while holding back my anger. Eventually, thinking I couldn't continue living like this, I decided to discuss with Aaron the idea of living with my parents. If that sounds tough, well, I'm busy with work. As expected, Aaron showed no interest in my situation, only offering non-committal responses. I was appalled by Aaron's indifferent attitude. Even when I talked about moving out from Susan's house, well, my mom and dad will manage somehow. Do whatever you want. Aaron's blunt words were the last straw for me. I decided to live with my parents and started planning to build a duplex house. Just in case, I mentioned to Susan and John about my parents' situation and that I had already received Aaron's permission. When Susan heard about the duplex, she probably thought I would stay and try to persuade me otherwise. But instead, she smiled kindly and expressed concern for Michelle. Oh, it was that serious. Then indeed, it's better for you to be close. Susan's unexpectedly kind response gave me a bad feeling, making my spine chill. I couldn't take the kindness shown by Susan and John at face value. While discussing the layout with the contractor, considering living with my K-giving parents, Susan and John somehow ended up joining every meeting. Despite my bad feeling, unable to refuse Susan's persistent presence, I eventually allowed them to attend. Don't worry about us. Susan and John, not participating in the discussion but watching my meeting with smiles, were nothing but a mystery. Nevertheless, construction progressed smoothly, and the duplex for my parents and me was finally completed. Feeling that Susan and John were up to something, I chose a time when they were both at work to exchange keys. After confirming that no one was home upon returning, I finally felt relieved. That evening, while I was preparing dinner, Susan suddenly came over and started talking strangely. By the way, your new house is finished, right? Can we go for a quick visit before you move in? I want to use it as a reference for when we eventually need K-giving. Susan's unusually kind tone and relaxed smile were clearly suspicious, overpowered by her persistence. I agreed to show her the house the next day, under the condition that it was just a viewing. I put the master key I had just received into my bag and headed to my car. For some reason, I hadn't seen John since the morning. Susan mentioned he had sudden work, but I still felt they were planning something. In the car on the way to the new house, Susan, sitting in the passenger seat, was oddly busy with her smartphone, although it felt unnatural. I couldn't tell what she was doing as I was driving. Upon arriving, Susan looked around nervously, making me suspect she was up to something. I kept an eye on her movements. The moment I opened the front door, Susan pushed past me and entered the house briskly, worried she might damage the new house. I hastily placed my bag in the shoe cabinet beside the entrance and hurried after Susan. This house is really nice. Susan, in a good mood, praised every corner of the house. I watched her for any suspicious movements. But there were no signs of anything odd at that time. Just as I was about to suggest it was time for her to leave, after spending over an hour enjoying the house, I heard a noise from the entrance, where no one should have been. Rushing to the entrance, I found John standing there with a broad smile. Hey, we're here. Can someone come to pick up our luggage? Responding to John's call, luggage suddenly began being brought in one after another. I tried to stop the luggage being carried in without understanding why, but I was obstructed by John and Susan, and before I knew it, everything was done. What exactly is going on here? As I glared, Susan looked down on me with a triumphant face. This house is for us couples to live in. You need to leave. I couldn't comprehend what Susan was saying at that moment. I rushed to the entrance and checked my bag, only to find the master key that should have been inside was gone. While I was searching every corner of the entrance, John came in front of me, laughing. Looking for this. Since we're living here from today, you better leave quickly. John, looking down on me, was holding the master key that should have been in my bag. Furthermore, my bag and shoes were carelessly thrown out of the entrance by Susan standing beside him. Realizing what Susan and John had been planning, I glared at them. I see. I picked up my scattered bag and shoes, holding back my tears as I got into my car and drove away from the new house. I went directly from the new house to the municipal office, received a divorce petition, and returned straight home. Upon my return, 
I found that most of the daily necessities like shoes and clothes that should have been there in the morning were gone. On my way to the new house, I realized that Susan had been busy with her smartphone to coordinate with John to take over the new house. Returning to the new house again, filled with frustration, I rang the intercom and heard Susan's cheerful voice. Perhaps to prevent me from reclaiming the new house, she locked the door and peeked out from a gap. When I handed the divorce petition through the gap, surprisingly, it was returned in a few minutes with Aaron's name on it. I knew it would come to this, so it was right to prepare. Also, thank you for leaving the documents for this house for us. The loan and documents related to the new house had been left in the new house to not get lost. I tried to hold back my tears and made a final stand, but Susan scoffed at that too. I've already contacted the bank, so I won't be responsible for what happens next. You're too naive. We've already been preparing for the refinancing and other procedures. Shocked, I immediately packed my and my child's belongings, completed the moving procedures, and moved back to my parents' house that day. About a month later, Susan unexpectedly called me, wondering what she wanted now. I sighed and answered, only to be shouted at by Susan suddenly. Hey. This isn't what we agreed on. You tricked us. What she was talking about was unclear, as the deception was on Susan and John's part. What are you talking about? I had thought that Susan and John had deceitfully taken the newly completed house and smoothly finished the refinancing. However, it seemed Susan was the one who had miscalculated. Susan had received a notice from the bank for a lump sum repayment and had been preparing to refinance with another bank. That was all well and good. But Susan made two mistakes because she didn't pay proper attention to the loan repayment discussion and signed the contract carelessly. The first mistake was that the loan was solely in my name. Susan, unaware that the loan was in a single name, assumed it was a joint loan with Aaron and was shocked by the lump sum amount. Moreover, Susan had naively thought that being co-borrowers meant they only needed to pay half the loan. But that's not how it works. Susan, who unilaterally made selfish demands at the bank, was turned away and ended up having to arrange for a loan from a different lender. However, Susan had overlooked something even more important. Susan's second mistake was their age. In my case, there was some leeway in the amount I could borrow and the repayment period, but it was impossible for Susan and John, who were over 60, to borrow the same amount for the same period. John had been working as a contract employee, so his income wasn't very high. Susan, although she worked part-time, only worked half days in the morning, so of course, her income wasn't substantial. There's no way the two of them could pay the mortgage for that house. Susan, who hadn't thoroughly checked the repayment plan, thought it was okay to pay the same amount as she saw in my repayment plan. As a result, they received a bill more than three times the amount they had anticipated. The reason for this call was that Susan, who had become furious after noticing the strange balance in her account when the payments started, was now lashing out at me. There's nothing I can do even if you tell me. But you, a full-time housewife, can't possibly pay such an amount. Aaron won't tell me anything, and there must be some trick behind this. Tell me what it is already. What are you talking about? There's no trick or anything. Aaron hasn't paid a penny for living expenses since before our child was born. Then, who has been paying for the living expenses up until now? I've been working from home, so I have a steady income. And as far as I know, I probably earn more than Aaron. Susan fell silent after hearing my story, but I could imagine her being dumbfounded over the phone. It had always been normal for Susan and John to pass the bill to me whenever the family went out to eat. It's only natural for the daughter-in-law to pay. They would say, but where did they think that money came from? I don't know what Susan and John have been spending their earnings on, but it seems they might have been counting on Aaron and my earnings for their retirement life without any savings. Exasperated by Susan's selfish words, I ignored her insults coming from the other end of the phone and hung up. Since then, Susan has been calling me daily, but I've been ignoring her calls. Eventually, I moved back to my parents' house with my son, Sean, but it was cramped for four people to live in. Having some savings after letting go of the new house, I decided to buy a reasonably priced second-hand property and remodel it for K-giving for Michelle's sake. After discussing with my parents, we decided to sell our current home if we were moving. Fortunately, we quickly found a buyer, 
and thanks to the rising lamb prices, we sold it for more than double the expected amount. The bank officer, who knew my situation, helped make the house sale go smoothly, so our family could purchase the new home without any extra expenses. A few days later, as usual, Susan called. For some reason, I picked up the phone without looking at the caller ID and answered while half asleep. Hey, Erica, could you lend me some money? Our income isn't enough to cover the loan, and we might get our water shut off soon. By the way, my family's house sold for so much that we could buy a new one outright. Maybe you and John should do the same, after treating me terribly and still relying on me. I was astounded and shared with Susan how we sold the house. Suddenly, Susan's sobbing stopped, and she hung up the phone. I thought this would finally stop the troublesome calls from Susan, but the problem wasn't solved yet. A week later, Susan called again. You, how many times do you intend to deceive us? Susan's voice was so loud it cracked through the phone. According to her, their house had been a pre-built home with zero value from the start. Moreover, the location was so poor that the land's value had decreased, leaving it almost worthless. No buyers came forward, and not only had Susan and John not received a cent, but they also received a bill for the necessary processing fees. After that, I blocked Susan and John's numbers and ignored calls from public phones until they finally stopped calling. Just when life seemed to settle down, Aaron suddenly called. Hey, there's a for sale sign at my house, and I can't get inside. Disgusted by Aaron's indifference, I sighed and told him about Susan. Aaron was surprised to hear my story, claiming he hadn't heard anything. But what surprised me even more was his lack of reaction to the news that we were already divorced. Aaron was furious about losing his house, but it was his own mother's doing, and now that we are divorced, it is no longer my problem. A few hours after Aaron hung up, he called again, apparently having arrived at the new house. However, all I could hear from the other end of the phone was the sound of Susan's family arguing. I later found out that Aaron had a lover at his job posting location. Having lost his home, Aaron intended to live with his lover, but it turned out she was married. Not only was Aaron promptly dumped, but he was also sued for compensation by the husband. Aaron, who had lost his home due to his parents' actions, was fired from his job and has since found a new job with a company that has employee dormitories, earning less than half of his previous salary. Moreover, Susan and her family were imposing themselves on him, living there without permission. Our family, having remodeled a second-hand property and moved in, was finally able to start a new life. As for me, I remarried Mr. Irving, a slightly older man who had kindly offered his advice on the remodeling of our new family home. Having both been divorced and being parents, we had a lot in common and were able to spend our days happily with shared values. Mr. Irving is a kind person who helps with my parents' care and quickly remodels any place that becomes too difficult for them due to his job. Caring for my parents is somewhat challenging, but I now have a peaceful life with a dependable husband and adorable children.